Please take your Bibles this morning, my friends, and would you go to Romans chapter 14. Yes, you heard that correctly. 14. No, we're not just uh, skipping over chapters 9 through 13. (laughs) This is just the best passage for us to work through today as we discuss what's on on the screen up here, we've been t- discussing this for a couple weeks now, how to handle differences in the body of Christ. We're going to walk through that some more today, just pick up where we wa- left off last week. I hope you're ready for this. Um, what's going on? Well, we've been traveling hard through Romans. Well, we decided to take a bit of a break through the month of June and just talk of some of these very practical and pastoral matters at Cross Point Community Church. Uh, our goal is this, that for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, and beyond years, that God would give us a reference point, um, a discussion guard and guide for differences that come up in the body of Christ. That, that's why we're doing this study. And I, I hope it's been a blessing to you how to handle differences in the body of Christ, the church. Here is our key truth that we're trying to embrace for this entire study. It is this. All believers should carefully evaluate how they handle differences in the body of Christ. And what are we talking about? Well, just like we've talked about the last couple of weeks, we're talking about differences of some theological persuasions. We're talking about differences in political persuasions. We're talking about differences in interests or qualities or giftings or personalities or temperaments. We're talking about differences in basic lifestyle choices. Whether we want to embrace this thought or not, differences abound in the body of Christ. And so often those differences raise their heads at the most awkward time and it creates, it can create, if you're not prepared for it, contention in the body of Christ. So far as we've been walking through this, this has kind of been our guide. And and by the way, hold on, because I'm just reviewing quick. Some of you are very thankful for that. Let's just work through this review. Here it is. What's our guide as we've been talking through this? What's our, our goal, kind of our mindset as we enter into this discussion on differences in the church? Here it is. With differences, believers should take this approach. Number one, pray God's grace. I mean, if there are differences in the church, what is the first thing we should do as brothers and sisters in Christ? We, we fall to our knees and pray that God would give us grace as we handle differences in the body of Christ. We pray for clarity and for charity and for humility and for discernment as we work through these differences and then what do we do from there we get up off our knees or even on our knees we open the sufficient word of God why because number two we seek God's word as the providential guide go to God's word what does God's word say This is exactly what we talked about last week when we first entered into this discussion on lifestyle differences. What does God's holy word say about this? Well, then number three and four, we identify the nature of the differences and we respond discerningly to all of these differences. Where we're at right now is deep into number three and deep into number four. Identify the nature of differences and respond discerningly to these differences. You'll remember, and you can turn your hand out over, that we sort of identified two primary differences in the body of Christ. If you think of back through your life, all the differences in the church, and by the way, this is uh, what uh, Pastor Matt a couple weeks ago called a lerman, all right? Uh, This is more like a guided study as we go to God's Word this month. We're looking very pastorally at the Scriptures all right. So when you think back through your life, you think of differences that come up in the body of Christ, you can really categorize them based on these two things, theological differences and lifestyle differences. Not that these are exclusive, as we'll look at next week, because there's another difference. My hand was forced on this one. <laughs> no, uh, as I've been thinking about this, I think, no, you can't get through talking about differences in the church without talking about personality differences. Yeah, so that's next week. All right. 
Differences in the body of Christ though primarily fall in line with one of these two areas, theological differences or lifestyle differences. This is what we've been discussing. I'm not going to go back and discuss all of those theological differences, but you can see them on your handout. Foundational doctrines, functional doctrines, supportive doctrines, and each one of these require very strong and very dependent discernment on God and His Word as we respond to these differences. Uh, when it comes to those foundational core differences in the faith, where do we go? Well, J- Jude 3 tells us, earnestly contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. However, you're not going dis- to you're not, you're not respond to every sing- thing on this list the exact same way. Especially when it comes into our discussion right now. Lifestyle differences. When you think about lifestyle differences... There's two basic lifestyle differences that you're going to find in the scriptures, and here they are. Not to make this oversimplified, but they're this. Number one lifestyle differences are choices, lifestyle choices clearly restricted in God's word. In other words, there's some that come to the body of Christ, and they know God's word says they should not be living this way, but they still do it. Last week we talked about how to handle this by grace and confidence from the Word of God. I would encourage you to go back and listen to last week's sermon if you missed it. What does God's Word say about restoring that brother? Even if it gets a little ugly at some times, it's confidence in what God says, and God's Word always wins. we got to get that in our mind. In the, word, in the body of Christ, God's Word must always have the final say. But then we come to this fifth one. Number two on this screen, lifestyle choices not clearly restricted in Scripture. You guys ready for some fun? (laughs) Because this is where it gets exciting, all right? I think probably all of us have been in churches where we have differences of opinion on what we're going to talk about today is Christian liberty issues. These are things that are not directly stated in Scriptures, but I just don't feel like that's right you've been there you know what I'm talking about I was brought up a certain way and that brother or sister on the other side of the room I cannot believe they do that you know what we're talking about and it creates this anxiety in your life and you think I've got to go to church on Sunday and worship with that person but I know what they did this week And then you go and you read through your Bible like five times trying to pinpoint a particular verse that says you're wrong. But you can't find one. You ever been there? There's got to be an imperative, a command, somewhere in the Bible that says they're wrong and I'm right. And you just keep reading and keep reading and keep reading. You even try this whole tactic that a lot of people do. It's called hermeneutical gymnastics. They take the word and try to twist it to make it say what they want it to say. You know what I'm talking about. And they come with what we know as a proof text. Hey, here's your proof text. You're wrong. And you look at that and you're like, my brother, sister in Christ, that is not what that says. (laughs) Very graciously, I want to tell you, that is not what that text says. How do we deal with these differences? Okay, if we go back to our house illustration, we got to go to the house illustration at least once a week. All right, when we have the theological framework in the house, and then we have the functional appliances in the house, and then we have the furnishings in our house, these are all what we talked about when it came to the theology of our church. Things that make the house function. But then when it comes to lifestyle, we're, act, we're talking about how we actually behave in that house. Last week we talked about when people behave badly in the house. (laughs) They're disobeying in the house. These are matters of obedience and disobedience because God's word clearly states what they should and shouldn't do. But there's a different aspect to this. What happens when believers don't necessarily act badly in the house, but they act differently in the house? (laughs) That's where we're at today. How do you handle it when a brother or sister in Christ chooses to enjoy entertainment that you would never participate in? How do you handle it? I'm just going to stir this up a little bit. You ready? 
How do you handle it when your brother or sister in Christ participates in a recreational activity that you would never participate in? How would you handle it when your brother and sister in Christ enjoys a food or a drink that you would never dream about consuming? Ever! On the flip side, let's think about the flip side of this because there is a flip side to any one of these differences. On the flip side, how do you handle it in the church when a brother and sister in Christ abstain from entertainment that you have always enjoyed? You're not going to go to that with me? Come on, what's your problem? How do you handle it in the church when a brother or sister in Christ chooses to abstain from a recreational activity that you've always done with your family? How do you handle that? How do you handle it when a brother or sister in Christ abstains from a food or a drink that you've always enjoyed? What do you do now? You get the idea. What do you do when a brother or sister in Christ chooses to wear clothes, to listen to music, to watch a TV series? And and you can just keep going on and on and on with all these lists that we like to create. What happens when my list doesn't match up with your list? And there's not a verse to talk about either one. What do we do? How do you handle it when brothers and sisters in Christ make different lifestyle choices than you do? Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, that is real life in the real church. All right, we, Cross Point Community Church is what's known as a non denominational church. We've already talked about this when it came to our theological stance. But I'm going to tell you, it draws people from all kinds of different backgrounds here. All kinds of different persuasions, ethnicities, all kinds of different perceptions of life. All of it. How do we handle lifestyle choices that are not directly, clearly talked of in Scripture? That is the matter of discussion for the next 35 minutes. Let's dial in on this. Lifestyle choices not directly restricted in God's Word. What are we talking about? So last week, when we're talking about lifestyle differences that are directly talked about in scriptures, we're talking about matters of obedience and disobedience. That is not necessarily what we're talking about right now. We're talking about matters of preference and conscience. This is, I prefer to do this or I prefer not to do this. This is not a chapter and verse issue. This is a, I just really don't feel or think I should be doing that. You know what it's like. The inner alarm system in your life and you participate in an event, it's like, you shouldn't be doing that. And you know, you're like, oh man, but what about the scripture? So you run the scripture, you cannot find it. That inner alarm system. This is not a chapter and verse issue. This is a, I don't feel like I should be doing that issue. These are clearly what are referred to as Christian liberty issues. What some would consider to be gray issues. Okay, As as you go to Romans 14 though, and we're going to go there in just a minute. The second point we look at in, in, in Romans 14. I'm going to propose that there are not gray issues in your life. You're fully convinced in your own mind is what the scripture says. And you obey God. Sure, there's gray issues out there, so we acknowledge that. But you obey God's working in your life. These issues are not going to be clearly identified in scripture. So there will be some room. And there must be some room for flexibility in these areas. Okay, what are some biblical examples of Christian liberty issues? Okay, in your minds, if you want to go to the Bible and see some of the examples that Paul brings out. And I love this because it's real life in the scriptures. You're probably going to find your way in one of two primary texts. 1 Corinthians 8-10 through 10 and Romans 14. Both of these texts very clearly talk about Christian liberty issues. Um, 
we will not spend a ton of time today. We'll, we'll reference and we'll walk through Romans 14, but realizing in about six months, we're digging deeper into Romans 14. So you'll just have to hold on for a deeper study. But you're going to go to these two texts. You're going to find that the two issues in the day of Paul to the first century church had to deal with these two words, diet and days. Both of these texts deal with these. Hey, what are you talking about, Pastor Andrew? All right. In the New Testament, in this church, in these churches, should meat be eaten or not? For all the hunters in this room, it's like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> For all the gatherers in this room, though, it, oh, really? Should meat be eaten or not? That was a real deal in the church of Corinth. That was a real deal in the church of Rome. Okay, let's just discuss, uh, discuss this a little bit. If you were a member of the church of Corinth, there's a little bit more to this. Why? Because the matter of eating meat was not just some nice cut off of the animal. It was meat that was about to be sold in the market, but prior to be sold in the market, it was offered to the idols. And so then you show up at Sister Sally or Brother Joe's house for dinner, and they come and they offer this wonderful meal to you, and they're saying, this, and you're like eating away at this thing, and you're like, this is awesome. Where did you get this? Oh, I got it at the temple market. <laughs> Why? Because it's cheaper there. And you're right in the middle of that bite. And you're like, mm, you got it where? And all of a sudden, inside you feel like, what? I have just sinned. Okay, that's the issue of eating or not eating in 1 Corinthians. However, the issue of eating or drinking in Romans 14 is this. Some people preferred meat, some people liked vegetables. <laughs> What's the deal? These are real deals in the body of Christ. They cause differences. All right, what about the days part of this? Okay, this, this can make maybe a little bit more sense. If in your church you have uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers alike, in the first century this was the real deal, the real life they were working through. The Jewish believers their whole life have grown up with the tradition of what do you do on Saturday? You observe the what? The Sabbath. Now all these Gentile knuckleheads come in the church and they're out partying on Saturday. I mean, not in a bad way. They're out having fun on Saturday. What's your problem? This was ordained by God. And all the Gentiles are like, no, 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 you didn't read it all. Christ has redeemed us from the works of the law. He has paid for the ceremonial law. We don't have to worship on Saturday. Well, you're a Jewish believer and you're thinking, Oh man, I'd really like to go hang out with that person on Saturday, but I have to hold to the Sabbath. And on top of the Sabbath, what about the feasts? What about Passover? What about tabernacles? What about all of these feasts that we're supposed to enjoy? And religiously, on your calendar, you put those if you're a Jewish believer. But the Gentiles are like, nope. You can understand right away how there's a bit of contention over these Christian liberty issues in the New Testament. They're over diet and days. Now Paul, in these passages, both of them, calls the person that is really struggling through this by a name. It's not necessarily a derogatory name. It's a descriptive name. He calls this person the weaker brother. However, we can't just make both of these passages say the same thing about this weaker brother. What am I talking about? If you go and you read through 1 Corinthians 8-10, through 10, you're going to find a weaker brother. This is someone that has just come to Jesus Christ out of, the, out of the ways of the world in idolatry. And Paul is saying, this brother is, is weak in the faith, so don't do something to cause this brother who has just come to Jesus to fall back into the lifestyle that he was saved from. That's the weaker brother in 1 Corinthians 8-10. through 10. So we're talking more of a, a newer believer. 
Well, if you travel into Romans 14, the second on our list, you're going to find the same terminology, weaker brother, but it's referencing a little bit different of a person. This is someone that has worshipped God most of their life. This is, this, this is referring to that Jewish believer who's come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, but we're talking about someone that truly has worshipped Yahweh for 20, 30, 40 years. And they're struggling with some of these things like diet and days. Why do I bring this up? Because it doesn't matter. There will be issues in the church. For that church, diet or days. In our church, in just a minute, I'll bring up some other practical ones. Hold on. In that church, though, it wasn't just a certain elite group of people that would look down on another group of people and say, I'm better than you. No, I love it because in 1 Corinthians, the weaker brother is a new believer. In Romans 14, the weaker brother seems to be a long-standing worshiper of God. Do you see what we're talking about? It's not if differences are going to come up in the church. It's when. And as that when comes, it's how will we, by God's grace, handle these differences. Okay, let's talk about some practical examples. 21st century. 22nd year of the 21st century. What about entertainment and media choices? I'm going to tell you right now that the Bible is not going to tell you what songs you should have on your Spotify playlist. As much as you want to go there, it's not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the Bible is not going to tell you what movie rating is acceptable on your Netflix account. If indeed your conscience allows you to have a Netflix account. It's not going to tell you. What do you do when your ideas of these playlists or movies looks different than someone else in the body of Christ. What about consumption choices? Oh no, here it goes. Food or drink. The New Testament believer is not going to find specifics on what foods to enjoy or not enjoy. Not going to find that. You're going to find more directives in the Old Testament when it comes to God directing His Old Testament people, but we understand that The law, Christ dealt with the law on the cross. The ceremonies that they went through, Christ dealt with on the cross. So we're going to run to the New Testament of Scripture to find the imperatives for the New Testament believer. I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble here, but you will never find a single address to enjoying a good cigar in Scripture. Just ask Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. Oh dear. Furthermore, although strongly warned against, catch this, although strongly, strongly, strongly warned against, and drunkenness clearly prohibited, the believer is not going to find a New Testament imperative for complete absence of alcoholic beverage. We want to. We We read like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Right now, you're already on edge. What do you do when your idea of abstinence looks differently than someone else in the body? What about recreation choices? What about political choices? As much as you want to read your candidate into the scriptures this next year. And I've read through the Bible several times trying to tell me who to vote for in 2024. I have a pretty good idea, but I couldn't find a verse on it. And you won't either. Why do we say these? These are what are known as Christian liberty issues in the body of Christ. There's going to be differences. There's going to be differences around the, the people you're sitting right now. Probably some of you have, you know, are fuming right now about some of the ones I even mentioned. Others are like, finally, he talked about them. Why? Because very practically, there are issues in the body of Christ where there's going to be differences. So then, what should we do? And I think we should run to the Bible. (laughs) Romans 14. 
I want us to go to Romans 14, recognizing that in a couple months we will dig a little deeper into Romans 14. But I want to draw three very clear directives from the Scripture on how we deal with Christian liberty issues. First point to be made in Romans 14 in regard to preference issues, matters of the conscience, is this. Refuse to become the what? Judge. And you'll notice that that J is capitalized because this passage is referring to God Almighty as the judge. So if you would just go with me to Romans chapter 14, let's just take the next couple minutes and let's work through verses 1 through 12. You can follow along as I read verse 1. As for the one who is weak in the faith, there it is. We just talked about the weaker brother. Boom. Verse 1. Welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Wow. I mean, if you like highlighting in your Bible, highlight, underline, circle that phrase, but not to quarrel over opinions. We could just stay there for a while. But we're going to move on to verse 2. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Uh, the hunter inside of me said that that is the most accurate verse in the Bible. <laughs> um, but then, let's go to verse 3. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. Why? For God has welcomed him. Verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? So we're talking about God's servant. It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Okay, if we can make this very practical, I mean, I have a daughter that works at J.C. Penney's. She's not going to go into the other side of the mall and start pointing a finger at the workers at well, Macy's or whatever that other store is there. And be like, you're not doing your job. It would just be nonsense. Why? Because they have different bosses. Do you understand? She is not the boss over that person. And I think we find a very strong argument towards this in the New Testament is be careful not to play God in the situation. God has drawn this person into saving faith, not you. God is able to keep this person till the day of Jesus Christ. Sure, there's the body of Christ. Sure, we keep each other accountable. Sure, we have elders that help direct the body of Christ. But my friends, in this passage, it says, be very, very careful not to play God in the body of Christ. If you skip down to verse 10, it says it very clearly. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 identifies this as the bema. Every single person that has ever come to Jesus Christ in saving faith will stand before God and give account of his life before a holy God. What did you do with the life I blessed you with? Again, write down 2 Corinthians 5, 10 if you want to think more on that. Verse 11. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Straight from Isaiah 45, also quoted in Philippians chapter 2. Now verse 12, kind of the conclusion of this section. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. What's the clear point? And matters of Christian liberty refuse to play God and be the judge. Let's not overcomplicate this. Again, I want to make very clear that this sermon comes after last week's sermon. Where we talked about things directly mentioned in the scriptures, clearly taught in the scriptures. There's a way we deal with those things in the body of Christ. That is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about Christian liberty type issues. Well, the point is not, please understand this, 
Stop being discerning in your own life. That is not what Paul's saying here. Remember the passage we started with about four weeks ago? Philippians chapter 1, Paul's prayer. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all discernment. This should be a discerning love in our own lives. We walk very discerningly through these things. But refuse to attempt to take the place of God in these Christian liberty issues. All right, second, you all with me? We're hanging on here? All right, first directive here in the book of uh, Romans chapter 14, refuse to become the judge, God is the judge. Now, number two directive, be fully convinced in your own mind. Okay, where do you read that? Verse 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. That, that verb is actually in imperative mode. And so uh, you can actually say each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 22. You just... Would you just jump down to verse 22 with me? The faith that you have, keep it, or keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. In other words, if your conscience is not condemning you in a matter of uh, preference, even if someone else's conscience is bothering them, it's okay. In a discerning way, it's okay to enjoy that liberty. Verse 23, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So in other words, if your conscience is condemning you, then don't do it. Refuse to do it. If there's something in your life saying, don't enjoy that liberty, then my friend, don't enjoy that liberty. The point is this, as you openly and submissively search God's word, as you search your heart, as you, I believe a part of this is even talking to those in, in close counsel with you. I'm talking about talking with pastors about some of these issues, talking to close friends about these issues, as you set up guards and guides in your life, then in discerning situations, enjoy your liberty and live a life of confident faith towards God. If your conscience is clear. Here, I mean, as you read this, I'm going to tell you, one of the toughest acknowledgments I've ever come across in the body of Christ is this. When talking about Christian liberties, in this passage, what sin for one person might not be sin for another person. Why? Because if your conscience is bothering you and you participate in this thing, it is sin before God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We like to make everything so cut and dry, black and white. Yes and no. Romans 14 is telling us there are some things that it's not that way. So how do we deal with things, my friends? Well, first part, refuse to become the judge. Second one, be fully convinced in your own mind. But both of these, I believe, are directed now through the third point. Be resolved to live charitably. What do I mean? Well, that's not really what I mean. What does the scripture say? Verse 14. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. Okay, hold on for a couple months on that one. We're going to get deeper into that when we get to Romans 14. Verse 15, though. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Well, this, is, this is so dynamic in the body of Christ. Let me read verse 15 again. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Catch that. By you enjoying your liberty in an uncharitable or undiscerning way, it is possible that you can derail another brother or sister in Christ. It's possible. He says that here. Realizing that Jesus died to save this soul. 
this is a Jesus person. I must live charitably towards this person. Verse 16, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. In other words, your relationship with God is not just vertical, it's horizontal. Do you understand that? If my vertical relationship with God is set right, then I'm going to care on a horizontal level for my brothers. How how do we know this? Jesus says this in John chapter 13. Remember what he says after he washed the disciples' feet. He said, by this shall all know that you are my disciples if what? If you have love one for another. Anytime you enjoy a liberty in your life, let it be guided through charity, the love of Christ. He continues on, verse 19, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. There it is again. He says it like twice. Do not for the sake of food Destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another to stumble by what he eats. Okay, what's the point? You read through Romans 14, and if you're like me, you're like, ooh, I need like another take of that. I need to read through that a couple more times, and I would encourage you to do so. Read through it over and over and over again. The point is your brother or sister in Christ is more important than your liberty. Catch that. Your brother or sister in Christ is more important than your liberty. So live out the love of Christ with your brother and sister. I'm not saying there's not a time to discerningly, appropriately enjoy your liberty. I believe that's also in this text. There are times to discerningly and appropriately live out your liberty. But as you discerningly and appropriately and biblically live out your liberty, remember, there are people around you. There are brothers in Christ. And the point of this passage is don't wield your Christian liberty like a weapon. Catch that. Don't use your liberty like a weapon. How could you use it as a weapon? Well, very clearly, you can use your liberty as a weapon because you flaunted it in front of everybody. I have this liberty. Hey, everybody, I'm going to live this way, and I don't care if you like it or not. And you know what? You should do this with me. Well, my friends, if their conscience is bothering them, no, they should not do that with you. Do you understand this? Don't flaunt your liberty and use it like a weapon on the flip side. Because remember, every one of these things has a flip side. On the flip side, don't use your conscience like a weapon. What do I mean? You following? We're getting into some fun stuff today, so I hope you're following. How do you use your conscience as a weapon? Your conscience is bothering you about a Christian liberty issue, and so now you're putting everyone else in the congregation in your conscience jail. Think of it that way. My conscience bothers me, so now everyone here has to have the same stipulations that I do. You place everyone in jail with your conscience. So do you see how these liberty issues can be very quickly turned into weapons? A weapon of liberty and a weapon of conscience. And what Paul is saying here is, stop it. Live charitably. Live discerningly. Enjoy your liberty, but do it with great discernment and charity. Now, you know the fact is this. You will never, ever please everyone. You will never completely be able to avoid offense. And so you're like, well, then what do I do? Oh, Lord Jesus, just quickly come. (laughs) Oh, what do you do? My friends, I think the greatest example is what we find in Hebrews. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. 
I love reading through the Gospels and seeing how Jesus interacted with people he came into contact with. People from all different relationships, all different backgrounds. My friends, embrace the way of Jesus Christ. Embrace the selfless love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with anyone and everyone we come into contact with. All right. Is everybody completely confused? No, you guys are great listeners. Here's what I want to do. The next five minutes, ten minutes, close out with some very practical suggestions with Christian liberty issues. Because right now you're like, ah, do I enjoy my liberty or not? Do I do that or not? I think we find some very important principles in the scripture that help guide us in decision making. So what I'm going to do right now is share six words and six questions When we're having this question, should I enjoy this liberty? Should I not enjoy this liberty? I believe there's, you could summarize it. Some have more. I mean, they advance this a little bit more. But I believe you can summarize this down to six basic words that are followed by six basic questions, starting with this one, glory. What a wonderful word, glory. Here's the question. Will enjoyment of this liberty hinder an accurate display of God's majesty? In other words, will this honor God? By participating in this liberty, will this activity honor my God? Okay, if we want to make this absolutely practical, uh, I remember trying to get this in my mind, and I still haven't got it, but I remember in high school thinking through this, what does it mean to glorify God? My dad's telling me to glorify God on the soccer field, and I want to glorify God by how I run my lawn mowing business. And I want to glorify God at school and on the wrestling mat. How do I glorify God? And it was explained to me this way. Think of your life as a commercial. Andrew, think of your life as a commercial. I mean, we've all been there. You've watched, you're watching something on YouTube and all of a sudden they annoy you again with a commercial. You know what I'm talking about. You can't wait to push skip that ad. (laughs) But do you know what it's like, though, when there's a good ad that comes up and all of a sudden you're drawn in? It's like you're watching 10 seconds and you're like, ooh, what is that? 20 seconds later, you're about to push that skip ad, but you're like, ah, this is interesting. You know what I'm talking about? My friends, that is to be your life and my life. When people see our lives, we are to be an appropriate example of the glory of God. We're to honor God with how we live. That when they see our lives, they see something precious. They see something that is dignifying to the great creator and sustainer of all life. They see our lives, it is a proper representation of the God of all glory. It is not a false representation. Because you and I have both know when that ads come on sometimes and you're like, that was just awful. (laughs) You couldn't get that thing off quick enough. My friend, don't let that ever be said about your life and my life, or any of our lives, when it comes to how we represent God. That person's not representing God. Get that off of there, quick. Do you understand what I'm saying? Be a good commercial of the glory of God. Here's another key consideration, gospel. Will enjoyment of this liberty hinder a selfless proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? In other words, as I'm sharing Jesus with my neighbors and my coworkers and my sports team members, will what I'm enjoying right now stand in the way from them coming to Jesus Christ and saving faith? Where do we find this? I think you find this on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5. What does Jesus say? You are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its savor. You remember this. He also says, you're the light of the world, but you're not going to hide this light. You're going to shine this light that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If you want to see this come to life, I put there 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I would encourage you, by the way, in your life groups the next couple of weeks to go through some of these texts. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you know what Paul says? I've become all things to all men so that I might win some. So that I won't hinder the gospel. You know what he's saying? He's not saying, ah, I can do whatever I want. He's saying, I am actually going to limit my liberties on occasion so that I can see some come to Jesus. My friends, that should be our heartbeat. When we enjoy our liberties, if it's standing in the way from someone coming to Jesus Christ and saving faith, we're willing to limit that liberty in that way. 
Here's another wonderful question, another word in question. It is the question of growth. Will this hinder my personal growth in Christ? Ask yourself this question, my friends. Will this, will enjoyment of this liberty hinder me from growing in Christ? I think Peter actually addresses this very well in 2 Peter. He says, take care. Some of your translations will say, beware. Beware or be on guard. Be on guard that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people (laughs) and lose your own stability, but grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beware. Be on guard. If there's a liberty in your life that is standing in your way from growing every day in Jesus Christ, then you need to seriously consider limiting that liberty. Three more. I'll make them quick. Offense. Will enjoyment of this liberty hinder the growth of other believers? Very clearly, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14. We've already read this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8 says, But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple... Will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. I mean, this is so appropriate. Am I willing to limit my liberty in in, in certain situations and in a discerning way so that it doesn't make my brother stumble back into the sins they were saved out of? This is very important to consider. And how about number five, the word authority? Okay, this is appropriate for all of us, but I would say particularly uh, for some of the younger ones in this room because you have a third aspect of this. Up there I put civil authorities. I put church authorities. By the way, the church authorities have no authority except from God's Word. <laughs> and I have authority for you to, to say to you, don't live this way or this way if God's Word doesn't say that. As elders and pastors here, our authority rests on God's word, not personal preference or opinion. Um, But then the third one, for younger ones in this room, it's a no-brainer. Parental authorities. So even though you feel like you might have a liberty to do this Christian Christian liberty-wise, and your conscience isn't bothering you, young believer in Christ, if your mom and dad say no, what does it mean? No, because the Scripture says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Do you understand where I'm going with this? It's no longer a Christian liberty issue for you. Think on that. Um, By the way, there is a way to manipulate and abuse that, parents. Don't abuse this. You don't have the right the entire life of your your child when they're 50 years old saying, you're not obeying me. (laughs) No. You have quickly become, you, you've gone years ago from their chain of command to their chain of counsel, if you put it that way. And there's another one here, enslavement. This is, this is very important in the life of a believer. And Paul exposes his own life in the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6. He says this, all things are lawful for me. That's actually a statement they said to him. And Paul responds with this, but all things aren't helpful I love that. They're saying to him, I can do anything I want. But he's like, but not everything you want to do is helpful to you. (laughs) Some would call that the principle of expediency in the life of a believer. But then he continues in verse 12. All things are lawful for me. So they said it again. Paul says this, but I will not be dominated by anything. My friends, this is what's known as enslavement. Will this Christian liberty issue, this Christian liberty that you're enjoying, will it, here's the word, will it dominate you? Some of your translations will actually use the word dominate. Will this master over you, this liberty? Practically, will this liberty become an addiction to you? If it is, then it is not according to the word of God. It has gone from a liberty issue to an addiction issue. Uh, My wife says this when it comes to this. I I appreciate this. 
when it comes to this enslavement? Will this own you? Here's a question that she likes to ask. Can I be happy without this? <laughs> Can you truly be happy and satisfied in your life without this? That's how you know if it's got you. So, as we look through this, there's six key considerations. Will you enjoy your liberty, my friends, this week? I would say in a very discerning way, in a very charitable way, as you consider six things, God's glory, the gospel, your growth, offense of other believers, authority, and enslavement. So what? What does this mean for you and for me? Well, I'll tell you this. The temptation is to just stay away from this kind of talk. Don't go there. You might be missing like 30 people the next Sunday. <laughs> and that's not who we are. That's not what we do, my friends. Let us go to the Word of God as our entire counsel. Let us talk of these things, some things that are taboo in some churches. No, let's put them out there. Let's talk of them. Let's pray God's grace as we forge ahead for the glory of God. So what? And here's the question. Will you, my friend, handle lifestyle differences at Cross Point Community Church biblically? And then the second point, as we see today, charitably. Will you enjoy your liberty being guided by charity? Will you refuse to use your liberty or your conscience as a weapon? And will you show the love of Christ through differences in the body of Christ? Come back next week as we continue to talk about differences in the church. You're ready to be done with this, but that's okay. We're going to talk about differences of personalities.